Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the one holy and living God, amen. So early in the week, as I opened up the lectionary to see what the gospel was for today, I read the story and then hazy, well, I read the story and then I inwardly groaned, realizing I had to preach on it. And then a hazy memory immediately filled my mind from a movie trailer that was a follow-up to The Exorcist, where this deep, multiplicitous voice says, Our name is Legion. All right, the mic's not on. Can you turn the mic on? I'm flip this switch. Turn to the right, Gilbert, right in front of you. There you go. Our name is Legion. I don't know, it doesn't work right now. <laughs> There's a junior warden in the house, and I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> so movies, of course, portray demons fantastically, scaring us with incredible visual effects and unexpected jolts. And typically, evil is located in one person, one character who is either annihilated or freed. However, in Scripture, in the New Testament in particular, in Jesus' back and forth with Satan and the temptations, in Paul's letters to the Ephesians, and in the picture painted in the book of Revelation, evil is very different. Evil is not one person. It is a force, the power and principalities, Paul writes, the cosmic powers of darkness, they are forces that Satan claims to control and offers to Jesus if he would only swear his allegiance to him. And it's not really something we talk about much in church, is it? Evil, Satan, the power of darkness. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but here's the thing. This morning we have this gospel, and we have this wonderful baptism where Parents and sponsors on behalf of Catherine will be asked if they renounce Satan, if they renounce the evil powers and all spiritual forces of wickedness. And sadly, in our world, we know all too well evil and the spiritual forces of wickedness, that in more than one tragedy this week, we see people violently enact the forces of hate and terrorism by cutting short the lives of God's beloved people. So where is the good news in a world that has yet to exorcise itself of these powers of darkness? And what in the world can a first century story of exorcism tell us 21st century Christians? Well, I think you got to dig into this strange story. So Jesus didn't just happen upon this guy in his travels. In fact, it looks as though he sailed across the Sea of Galilee specifically to save this man from his illness. Now, you all remember the story of Jesus calming the storm, right? You all know that story. Well, that just happened. He and the disciples had been hanging out on the other shore in Galilee, fishing, talking, I don't know, when all of a sudden Jesus said, hey guys, let's get in that boat and go across to the other side. Now it's called the Sea of Galilee because it is a really big lake, 8 to 10 miles wide. And it also was a definitive dividing line between the Jewish territory of Galilee and the Gentile, Greek-speaking world in Gerasene. And there is no reason for us to think that the disciples wanted to make that journey, but Jesus needed them. Because he needs them to all get into that boat and start steering it across, because apparently he had to take a nap. Halfway across, he falls asleep. And then out of nowhere, the waters begin to rage against that boat as if the sea itself is possessed. And the terrified disciples wake Jesus up. And the minute he opens his eyes without a word, the wind cease and the water is calm. And all the disciples look at one another and say, who is this that even he can command the wind and the 
water to obey him? The disciples ask that question, but they don't have an answer. However, the minute they step foot on that rocky shore, the tormented man does. He confronts Jesus and the disciples immediately and says, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? He knows exactly who Jesus is and why he's come. So it's almost as if the cosmic forces really tried to keep Jesus and those disciples from getting to that other side. They tried to whip up the storm and scare them into turning around and going back, but they don't. And as often happens in the gospel, which is a good reminder for us, evil has no trouble naming the saving power that will cast out darkness and bring in light. When Jesus asks the man his name, however, all he says is legion. And that's not a name. It's a noun. Legion means an army of five to 6,000 Roman soldiers. Legion conveys a mind that is occupied, under siege, by these thousands of voices creating a delusional reality of torment. A torment that has been made worse by being cast out to live naked, ashamed, abandoned among the dead. So just that fact that Jesus goes to this man tells us something pretty remarkable about what God thinks of us. Why did Jesus cross the lake? Yes, the joke applies to get to the other side. But also because I really believe he was called. As we heard in that psalm, God hears the cries of the anguish. Jesus didn't just willy-nilly decide, hey, let's go for a boat ride today. No, he's on a quiet shore of Galilee where all is safe. And he hears someone calling out in need. And so he crosses into unfriendly territory to get to that person. An unclean man living in what would be considered the faithless territory of the Gentiles amongst the ritually unclean lit land of the dead. In other words, this is the darkest place for a Jewish prophet or teacher to be. It is the last place the Son of God would ever be expected to step foot. But there he is. What does that tell us? The darkest places, the fallen places where we most want to be found by God are also the places where we can feel the strongest connection to God. They are the places that none of us want to go in here or out there. Places of grief and shame and loss. Places where, like this man, abandonment feels deserved. And secrecy seems to be our only hope. When we are in those places, God hears that deep part of us longing for wholeness. And the saving power of God will not be driven back by any storm. Last month, I sat with many of you here in this church and listened to what I thought was a very powerful sermon by the Reverend Glenna Huber. She preached on John's gospel story when Jesus meets the paralyzed man sitting by a pool of water, water well known for its healing powers, yet he doesn't seem to be availing himself of it. So Jesus asks him a direct and challenging question. Do you want to be made well? And as she shared, it's a challenging question, even though it seems so obvious the answer, because Jesus knows that bringing in the light, that that healing will change us, and it will upend the world we live in. It will upset whatever system we have gotten used to, no matter how dysfunctional that system may be. So we have to really desire it. We have to recognize our active 
participation in it. We have to realize that God calls and equips us to join with him in defeating those powers of darkness. But not everybody wants to upset systems, even when they are dysfunctional. Not everybody wants to bring in the light because, as one person said, the devil you know is sometimes a lot easier than the God you don't. I mean, just notice how the people react to what Jesus has done. He has restored this man, clothed him, healed him. He is in his right mind. And what do the people do? They ask Jesus to leave. They are terrified of what Jesus' healing has brought. Why? Why do they ask the demon-possessed man to leave? What is it about God's healing that scares us? That question is very present in our 21st century world. What is it that scares us from changing what needs to change? As one late night talk show commentator said this week, quote, it's as if there is a national script we have all learned. And by accepting this script, we tacitly accept that the script will end the same way every time with nothing changing, except for the loved ones and the families of the victims for whom nothing will ever be the same. When those first century people experience a power on earth among them that restores a person and their community, it challenges that system they've been living in. It challenges that status quo that we heard about in Isaiah, where the prophet is saying, stop telling the people to keep out and be shunned because you are too holy for them. It challenges a system where we pin all the evil on one person that we can then shun and demonize. Jesus shows that community change is possible. Jesus upends an accepted structure of their society, which is exactly why they want him to go. And they can't unsee what they saw, and they're going to keep hearing about it, because Jesus tells the man who wants to be with him, no, you can't. You are now called to share the good news of God. Stay here and tell the people how God reached out to the lowest of the low. Tell the world how love saved you. Now, I'm not going to ask us to sing it. I kind of wish I had requested it. But you all know the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, right? You all have that tune right there, right? So it's the music is obviously Bach, the words of Martin Luther. And the third verse says this, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath will his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. What's the little word? I learned this week. Baptizatus sum. I am baptized. That is the love that has saved all of us. That's what we will watch symbolically today as Catherine is baptized into Christ, as Paul said, that dressing gown represents literally clothed with the armor of light. That is God's claim on all of us all the time. And when you deeply believe you are worthy of that love and belonging, you have power within yourself to reach out and share that good news that you cannot believe you have. That is the basis of our hope. That is the faith we have which helps us to believe in that which we cannot see. That is what enables us to partner with God in the ways each of us are called to overcome the darkness and bring in the light. And it's been my experience 
Now, when you know that deep in your heart, it's because you had a first-hand experience of God in your life when you were at the lowest of the low, and that power and saving love reached out and held you. So go and tell your good news story. Go and be a part of changing and upending this world in ways that destroy the powers of violence and bring in the love and the light. Amen. Amen.